Hello, and welcome back to Postcards from the Past, a video series from the Marathon County Historical Society in which we pull out some images from our collection and invite you to tell us which one you want us to talk about. And then we talk about it. In the last video, you decided that you wanted to know more about the harness racing at the fairgrounds. And at the end of that video, I put up two more images and invited you to weigh in. The first option was the 1911 fire of the Rothschild Pavilion, the original one. And the other option was the 1912 flood. And you chose pretty overwhelmingly that you wanted to hear about the 1912 flood. So that's what we're going to do today. So this particular postcard, it shows a very specific thing. It shows the damage to the Schofield Bridge, which happened in the evening of July 23rd, after the Eau Claire River, which had a boom sort of right before it entered into the Wisconsin River north of this. Well, that burst, and all that extra water and all the logs and things that were there came and surged into the Wisconsin River and caused this bridge to get washed out. But this is just a tiny fraction of the damage that was caused during the course of that evening and the following day. And maybe a big part of this is the fact that nobody really expected this to be a problem. Because yes, it had been raining in the area. Um, in Wassa, they measured about four inches of rain over the day before things got out of hand. But the Wisconsin River was sitting pretty low for the time period, and they didn't think that this was anything to worry about. And after all, this was July. This was not when the peak flooding season was. Most of the time, if it would be flooding, it would be in the spring. That's when all of the ice and snow of the previous winter melts and floods the Wisconsin River. And yet, even as they went to bed that evening, things were starting to get out of hand further north. The people of Wassa may have only reported about four inches of rain, but Wassa was on the edge of the storm. And further north, the communities were getting hammered with the precipitation. In Merrill, where the river would ultimately wreck a great deal of havoc, by 9, 9.30, there was attempts to try to warn the neighbors to the south of the coming flood. But unfortunately, the telegraph and telephone lines had been cut in the storm, and so the water continued to go south. Thankfully, the phone lines from Brokaw to Wassa were still intact. And a little after 10 o'clock, W.L. Edmonds, who was the manager of the paper mill up in Brokaw, he was woken from his bed with a phone call telling him of what was coming. Around this time, they had attempted to try to get people out, some workers out at the paper mill, to open the gates at the dam in order to release the pressure and hopefully save it. But the rushing water had kept them from completing their task, and they only just managed to get out with their lives. And now, all of that water, even though the dam itself didn't necessarily break in spectacular fashion, it was pulling water from the dam, as well as all of those logs that had been piled, waiting to be taken in and used at the mill. And all of this debris was being added to the already considerable amount of water that was flowing south. And actually, even as W.L. Edmonds woke up and ran into the streets to try to get people aware of this, they were already starting to see the water rise at the northern end of the city. Edmonds managed to rouse the city of Wassa, and men rushed out into the night to do what they could against the coming water. Not that there was a whole lot that they could do, mind you, but they did their best to mitigate what they could. According to the accounts of the men who did go out and brave the storm that evening, it was a completely harrowing experience. It's sort of a sensory deprivation thing going on, where there was just a complete lack of light. Because, of course, you have the storm, so you can't really see anything by the moon or starlight. Power from the dam had been knocked out pretty early, and so there really wasn't much to see by there either. Maybe the best you could have was a maybe lantern waving in the storm, but that really wasn't very much light to see by. And if the lack of light wasn't enough, there was a constant assault of sounds that hit them. Just the constant roar of the storm, the wind, the rain, all of that. The rushing of the river, now running amok. And all of the stuff that was being carried in its wake. All of these logs and debris that were constantly churning and cracking and booming against each other. Apparently the only thing that cut through all of this was the occasional crack of thunder and lightning overhead. It would illuminate everything for the briefest moment before going back into the darkness. And this is not something that they liked because they really didn't need the distraction as they were barely hanging on. They were maybe a, a moment from slipping and falling and getting carried away in the swell. 
These guys did their best to do what they could, although there really isn't a whole lot you can do to stop the Wisconsin River going wild as it was that evening. But there are some interesting points that come out of this. For example, when Dan McNaughton led a team of men to carry a bunch of lumber-laden train cars onto the railroad bridge north of the dam, which that extra weight helped to anchor it in place and kept it from being washed away like many of the bridges on the Wisconsin River were that evening. But for the most part, whether it was a bridge or a business or a home, it was all washed away, damaged, or destroyed in the floodwaters. One particular bright point in the evening was when floodwaters managed to get into the warehouse owned by Mr. Paff, who had been storing a shipment of lime there. The resulting chemical reaction caused the whole building to go up in flames, I'm guessing not particularly long after the chemical reaction ran out. But despite all of this happening that evening, the harrowing experiences and the many, many close calls that happened, miraculously, nobody died. At least that evening. Because the following day, there still was quite a bit of raging water coming down. The storm had lifted, the sun had come out, but there was one man, a local farmer, who made the perhaps foolhardy attempt to try to ford the still raging river to deliver a shipment of milk, and unfortunately got caught up in a carriage and he drowned. And of course, even though the sun had come out and the storm had stopped, that didn't mean that these communities were safe of the flood. Down in Rothschild, for example, which encountered quite a bit of flooding itself, the dam had managed to stay in place throughout the evening, but it was still being threatened by all of the stuff that was getting caught up and moving towards the river. And so they brought out some selected use of dynamite charges to help clear the pressure that was building up and managed to make it sure that nothing else happened. But even though over the course of the following day, there was still this constant danger and threat caused by the flooding waters of the Wisconsin River, it didn't stop people from coming out and surveying the flood with their own eyes. And we know this because they were captured in the many, many photographs that were taken on July 24th. There were a number of professional and probably amateur photographers that were out and about over the course of that day, documenting all the destructive results of the previous evening. In our collection at the Marathon County Historical Society, we have literally hundreds of unique images that were taken of the flood in 1912, whether they're photographic prints or postcards, cabinet cards, reprints, even stereographs. It is entirely possible that July 24th was the most photographed day in the history of Marathon County, at least relative to the number of cameras that are you know, physically available to be taking those pictures at the time. And looking at the resulting postcards that came out of all of this, it's pretty clear that the postcard makers were doing their best to make as many of them and get them out as soon as possible. Because a lot of these postcards, they're cut crookedly, they have errors in the printing or in the emulsion process that would probably have disqualified them from being put on the shelves in normal circumstances. And yet, they were put out on the shelves and people bought them up. And it's worth considering that these postcards sort of have a built-in expiration date for the people who are selling them. If I'm going to go to the kiosk at the bookstore and pick out a postcard to send home to the family while I'm in town, maybe a week after the flood, I want that flood picture to send. Maybe two weeks, maybe a month. But at a certain point, it's not current anymore. And so the connection to that moment disappears. Compared to, for example, a picture of the county courthouse, which is, you know, it might change, that, that tree no longer is there, but, you know, it's close enough. You can continue to reproduce that postcard and see a return on it. But instead, they did produce all of these postcards, which I think is pretty remarkable. Not only that they produced them, but it's important to keep in mind that people purchased them and then saved them. Not as a souvenir of your time in Wassa, you know, again, if you're coming here for a conference, you're probably more likely to buy a picture of the courthouse, which you saw rather than the devastation of a flood from years ago. But people did continue to buy them and hold on to them, not only in that moment making the decision, that intentionality of saying, I want to hold on to these, but that they continue to make that decision as time goes on, that they continue to say, hey, yes, I know I have to clean out this closet or pack up my stuff to move to a different house. But that postcard collection in that box, in that scrapbook, in that photo album, that's something that I need to hold on to. This is something that's important to me. 
It's very similar to how people will hold on to that newspaper edition from the date that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, or the moon landing happened for the first time. These are moments that as they're happening, they have a deep impact on many of us. And if it does, you're holding onto that newspaper not because you think that it's going to be worth something in 20 years. For most people who do that, whether it's collecting some you know, postcards of a flood in 1912 or that edition that they're holding onto from John F. Kennedy's assassination, they recognize the historical moment that they're living through. They were there. They remember. They want to not forget it. And so maybe by holding onto something physical, it's a way of you know, continuing to hold on to that moment in time, that memory. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting parallel to draw nonetheless. But I think that's a good place maybe to wrap up this discussion about a history of the 1912 flood of the Wisconsin River and the surrounding area. Um, it's not the only history. Obviously, there are more details that we could get into, but I th you know, it's a nice overview. And I think it does a good job of bringing in these postcards and providing sort of a different aspect and understanding what's going on. Speaking of postcards, uh, this is the point in the video where I get to put up two more and invite you to tell me which one would you like to see uh, a little video about next time. This time, I'm going to go with the theme of transportation. So on one hand, we have a picture of the early airport in Wausau. This is the Alexander Airport, what we know it as today. And the other one is going to be of one of the many depots here. Specifically, I believe this is the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Depot in Wausau. Um, both very interesting and have interesting stories, but I can only talk about one, so that's where you come in. Um, there will be a link in the description here below that will allow you to vote. It'll take you to a, a web, our website, which has a, a very simple, you know, one or the other. Um, and you can always leave a comment if you, if you feel one way, uh, specifically if you have any questions that you'd like to see addressed. If there's things that you want to know about either of these, that would be helpful to know so I can include it. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time for another postcard from the past.